An absolutely gorgeous day. We're continuing on in our look through the uh, book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, this morning I'd like to talk about the tools that God uses to actually help us grow. Uh, when I was, as I recall, I think I was in the third grade, and we were doing a science experiment, and so the teacher took Dixie cups and put uh, dirt in it, and then we would put a seed inside the Dixie cup, and then all the cups were lined up by the window, and our name was on the outside of every cup. Did anybody do anything like that when you were in school? How many years? You're so old, they didn't have seeds back then. They just... Uh, so th so that you put a name on it, and everybody else's cup was sprouting something, but not mine. <laughs> I know. And I was so frustrated. By, and I thought maybe some enemy had gone in and stolen my seed. Or maybe I, I put the seed in upside down and it was growing the wrong way. Or something, you know, just you don't, you don't think clearly. And uh, eventually I wanted to just tear it up and see if the seed was in there. And the, and the teacher said, if you leave it alone, it will grow. And so I was patient and eventually it did sprout. I will not tell you that it grew stronger and greater than all the other seedlings, but at least it did show growth. You know, a lot of times we look back at our childhood days and wish for those carefree moments. You know what's true about our childhood? We worry about even little seeds. We worry about winning games. We worry about tests that are coming up. Our, our childhood is not quite as carefree as we imagine it to be. And we do grow up. That's part of the point, isn't it? In fact, any parent would be very concerned if their child was not growing. Uh, when a, a child is very little, we think, oh, to be a child again. Just remember, if you go young enough, it was nothing but diapers and crawling on the ground, and none of us want that again. But to a child, their need is the most important need. And others only exist to meet it. And if, they, if that need is not met very quickly, they get very emotional. A little child who doesn't get food when he wants it or a toy when he wants it usually gets pretty loud about that. And if you notice, little children will interrupt anything else that's going on around them just so that they can get what they want. And by the way, little kids are not naturally intuitive sharers. They're not always generous. In fact, usually, if they only know eight words, one of them is mine. And they just grab it and pull it back to themselves. Life actually requires growth. And God has built into all life the capacity for growth. He wants us to grow physically. He wants us to grow intellectually. He wants us to grow interpersonally. He wants us to grow culturally. And he wants us to grow spiritually. And I think everyone desires to grow. In fact, I have never talked to a person and said, how are you doing? And had that person say back to me, you know, I've been stagnant for about 10 years, and I'm loving every minute of it. Nobody ever says that to me. So we want to grow, and only God can cause growth, but we can actually inhibit the growth God wants to cause. You see, the believers in Corinth, they wanted to grow too. But the way they went about their growth actually inhibited their ability to do it. And Paul talks to them and says, you haven't grown at all. Look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 3. It says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Four years they've not grown at all. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for, for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? You see, what happened was, is they believed the way to grow was determined by who your teacher was, and that you could really grow better if you had a better teacher. And what Paul wants them to know is that it is God that causes growth in our life. So he identifies some tools in this passage we're going to look at that God uses, and the first is God uses humility to grow us. Humility. Humility. Humility is just recognizing that we don't know it all. We still have something to learn. 
Humility recognizes that there are seasons that we are in. You don't go out and plant seed in the winter time. There's a springtime for planting. There's a season for cultivating. There's a season for harvesting. There is a season in our life, and often we ignore those seasons. It's kind of a, a humble thing to say, in this season of my life, these are the things I need to give attention to. You know, our children are grown, they're adults, they're out of the house now, but back when they were little and small and very dependent on us, there were lots of things that I would not have been able to do. I spend my life and my time very differently now than I did when they were little, because that's the season. If I'd have spent my days uh, back then like I do now, I would not have been a good father at all. Humility recognizes the season that you're in. And humility recognizes that we actually have to work together. You can't do this all by yourself. We actually need community. Humility recognizes that there are things that are bigger and more important than ourselves. And so we begin to approach the concept with humility. You can't work for God if you won't work with others. That's what God wants us to know. People who are claiming that they're doing something in the name of God, if they're unwilling to work with others, then they're not really working for him. The second tool that I want you to look at is the tool called grace. God uses grace to help bring growth in our life. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, by the grace God has given me, by the grace God has given me, I've laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. See, grace actually motivates you. It animates you. And it not only helps you act, it helps you act in the right way, for the right things, with the right reasons. See, Paul is letting them know that he's not trying to impress anyone. He's not laying a foundation. He's not working with the Corinthian believers because he wants to impress anybody. He's not trying to earn their approval. He's not trying to do something because he feels guilty and obligated and he needs to pay back a debt. It is the grace of God that motivates him. He understands a simple thing. God has invested by his grace, I didn't earn it, God has invested certain abilities in me, and God has presented me with certain opportunities, and so I'm just going to take the grace of the ability and the grace of the opportunity, and I'm just going to share what God has given me where I am. And Paul believed that if you did that, incredibly good things will happen. When we embrace humility and when we walk in grace, that's when we begin to see what God is growing and building in our lives. Now, grace actually requires that there's only one foundation, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. You see, disunity doesn't happen because we're all doing different things. Disunity occurs when we try to have different foundations. Uh, let's see if I can explain this. Uh, uh, how, how many know? I actually don't remember the number. I just remember what it's more than, all right? But uh, how many know there's more than one denomination in Christianity? And uh, uh, how many know there's more than 500? How many know there's more than 1,000? How many know there's more than 10,000? More than 10,000 denominations in Christianity. How does this happen? And here's the thing. Any of those denominations, if you ask them, did Jesus come and give his life to pay the price for all of our faults and failures and to reconnect us to God? They all say yes. But they have another foundation. And it's amazing what churches can disagree about, what people can disagree about inside of a church. For example, one church may say, you know, we believe that communion should be from a common cup and we all drink out of the same cup. And another group of people go, yeah, I'm not sharing germs. I'll share Jesus, but I'm not sharing germs. So we're going to use the little tiny individual cups. And what do they do? They split over that. There's the one cup church and the many cup church. And, and then there are people who go, you know, when we baptize people, we put them all the way under the water. I even know one pastor that holds you underwater based on how long you were a sinner. 
So you, you definitely want to be baptized early in your life because later you might not survive the experience. Or you're going to go straight, straight from the baptism to heaven, now, all the way underwater, and, and other places go, well, we just sprinkle people. And, and so what do they do? They divide over this, and they will even say, oh, no, no, if you're just sprinkled, that's not a real baptism. What are they saying? They're building a foundation other than Jesus. What they're saying is, what Jesus did is not enough. You also need to do this. That's not just building on the foundation. That's building a different foundation. And then there are churches that will go, we want to sing the same songs Jesus sang around the campfire with his disciples. Nobody knows what they were, but they think they do. And they will fight about that. And then other, oh no, it has to be a new song. And so they'll split over that. And what instruments are we allowed to use? There are actually churches where the only instrument is allowed is the human voice. No other instruments. And so you have the no instruments church and the every instrument other th under the sun church. And just all these things. Uh, you're not, most of you are not old enough or have hung around in the circles that I did. But I can remember back when people used to fight over whether... A piano was allowed in the church. They used to call, I'm not kidding this, they used to call the piano the wooden brother. And drums, those were straight from hell. <laughs> they had no business being in the church. People thought this, and they would fight over this, and they would argue. And, and dress styles, and whether you sit in pews or in chairs, or whether the windows are stained glass or the clerk, just all this stuff. And this is what I want you to know. When we use those things to divide us, it is not because we have different preferences or doing different things. What we're saying is it's a different foundation. If you don't do it this way, it's not right. And what Paul said is that never works. It never works. People create discord when we build different foundations. When people do this, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to create discord today. No one wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to be disrespectful to other people today. I've never met that person, but I have met people who woke up in the morning and said, I'm right, and they're wrong. And as soon as we've determined what our foundation is and we've built it, then we will create discord and we will be disrespectful. And it promotes a kind of pride and a condescending attitude towards others. So that's what happens. The third tool that God uses is truth. Growth requires truth. Growth requires truth. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 3. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Not everything in life has the same value. Uh, and one of the sad truths is we're not actually all that good at assessing or estimating the appropriate value of things. There are some of us that will give incredible amounts of time and energy to something that doesn't last. It's just temporary. I have known people who have spent more time on their wedding than they did on their marriage. Months in planning for a wedding, that ceremony is going to be over in 30 minutes. But no investment into the marriage. Time and energy for things that won't last. We, we can fiercely protect things that have no value. And we can foolishly risk things that really do have incredible value. We are not really good at knowing what's truly valuable, except there are some small rooms in our lives when it becomes clear. For example, if you are in a room and it's a funeral home, all of a sudden it seems like it gets clear about what really mattered and what really didn't. Or if you're in an emergency department room, or an ICU room in a hospital, intensive care unit room in a hospital, it's astonishing how in those small spaces, all of a sudden we realize how important people are and how unimportant some things that we spent our entire lives pursuing was. And this is what I want you to see. We shouldn't have to wait until we get into those tiny rooms to figure out what's truly valuable because by then it is often too late. 
That's why God gives us a couple of incredible resources so that we can understand and learn what is truly valuable in our life because we don't do this naturally. Right? Uh, how many have ever seen uh, a, a video of a person who was uh, uh, proposing to somebody else? You ever seen that? And, and, and when they, sometimes the gentleman will go down on one knee, but he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a ring. And what do most of those rings have in them? Diamonds. That's right. And it's astonishing to me, after she says yes and puts that ring on her finger, how that becomes the prominent hand for, even though she's right-handed, her prominent hand, everything is done with the left hand after that because she wants you to see, you know? Says, what time is it? Well, let me see. Uh, I, um, and, you know, the, you, go to, go, you go to eat in a restaurant, and all of a sudden your left hand, cause, and people will notice the ring. They just do. And, but, and I've never seen anybody who, when they got down on the knee, they, they reached in and they pulled out a little twist tie that goes on the, on the bread and just wrapped it around their finger and says, you know, will you marry me? I think she would cry, but not for the same reason. Okay. <laughs> See, what do we need to know what's really valuable? Well, what we need is we need Scripture because Scripture challenges our value-conscious abilities. And we need the Spirit because the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us in the truth. And you should know something. Scripture and the Spirit are often going to disagree with you. If you want a Bible that only agrees with you, you're going to have to write your own. Scripture insists on breaking through our assumptions about what's valuable to give us wisdom before we're in tiny rooms so we can live our life with the valuable things that God has entrusted to us. That's what God wants to give us. The last tool I'd like to talk about is the tool of time. The tool of time. Gardens don't grow overnight. Buildings aren't constructed in a day. Time is required. But a lot of times we feel like we have failed at something in life because we didn't accomplish what we wanted or experience what we wanted. And I think there's a better phrase. In fact, Paul used it in the passage we looked at. The phrase is, not yet. Now, I don't know what kind of a student you were in school, but I did not become a good student until I got to college. I just thought everything else in life was more interesting and more important than my education. So I brought home lots of report cards that contained letters in there that were not A and they were not B and they were not C. In fact, I had quite a few Fs growing up. Did anybody else have a, you know, just me. Okay, so here's... <laughs> It's okay, I, you know, I, I own it. But here's the thing. I would have been so happy. I, I would go home and show that report card to my parents. Actually, I, I, I never showed it to them. They always had to ask for it. And, and I would pull it out, and they would look at it. And I would see the disappointment on their face. And then I would hear the conversations and the lectures about how I needed to better spend my time and study and take this stuff seriously. And if I ever wanted to amount to anything or accomplish anything, I, I needed to work at this. And, just, they, they, they would, and I just wish, I just wish that they'd had a different grading system, like A and B and C and then just not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Because there are things that because it hasn't happened yet, we've allowed that to be a failure and we're defined by it. And what God says, it's not yet. I still am giving you time to grow in these areas. It's astonishing how often we just assume that I'm never going to be anything more than I am right now, that I've grown up to this point, but not really so much after this point. You see, God wants us to understand there are some things that are not yet. I was, I was driving home one day in the car. I had Rachel with me. She was in high school, and she said, Dad, I'm going to ask you a question, and I know the answer is going to be no. And I said, well, that makes it very easy for me. So go ahead, what's your question? And she was asking to do something. And when she got done, I was silent for about, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 seconds. It probably felt like whole minutes to her. And I just said, yes, you can do that. And she said, what did you say? I said, yes, you can do that. She said, why are you saying yes? Because when I asked you this last year, you said no. And I said, you're older now. And you have become more competent in some things. And I think you can handle this. So the answer is yes. And I watched her sit back in the front seat of that car. And her mind just whirling, wondering what else she was allowed to do now. 
she hadn't realized she needed to re-ask all those things all over again. You see, a lot of times our inability becomes our identity if we don't realize God is using the gift of time in our life. If we have a non-growth mindset, if I don't think I can grow and master the material, I will have to cheat or I will have to pretend or I will have to compare myself to someone who is worse. You see, this is what's true. Human beings are great works of progress that mistakenly think they are finished. We think we're done, and God is still at work. Now, how we measure our life and the growth in our life, sometimes it's our financial status. Have we increased there? Sometimes it's our title, some position we've obtained, the neighborhood we live in. But I'm going to recommend there's some other options for you in thinking about if you've been growing over time. For example, uh, are you bolder right now than you were a year ago? Um, are you better at forgiving now than you were a year ago? Do you have deeper relationships now than you did a year ago? I think it's one of the saddest things on the planet when our best friends were someone we had more than a decade ago. And I know what some people say. I've heard them say it. If I had better friends, I'd have better relationships. Maybe if you had better relationships, you'd have better friends. See, Paul just kept trying to break through. It's not about who's doing the teaching. I planted, Apollo watered, but it's God that makes things grow. Uh, are you more honest now than you were a year ago? Are you more generous now? than you were a year ago? Are you more patient now than you were a year ago? Are you actually better at recognizing and appreciating the gifts that God has put into your life now than you were a year ago? Are you kinder now than you were a year ago? Are you more gentle now than you were a year ago? Is your trust greater that God is actually at work in every area of your life, is that trust greater now than it was a year ago? See, God is at work right now, and he's committed to giving you the gift of time. Time is not your enemy. It's a gift from God, and he's using it. He's giving you this day because there's things that he wants to grow in you because it's not that you have failed. It's just not yet. He's working it out for your good and for his glory. And it's not just the passing of time. It's how we invest our time. You have to invest in a marriage to have a great marriage. You have to invest in friendships to have great friendships. And we have to invest in our community of faith if we want to be a great church family. See, our world needs to see what grace looks like. Our world needs to know that God really is good and his only motive is love. And that he wants to accomplish incredible things in our life. And the only way it happens, the only way the world sees that, is if we allow him to grow us into who he's created us to be. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, um, we often struggle we get frustrated with ourselves because uh, we're not living up to our own expectations and we're pretty sure we haven't even come close to yours. Would you help us this morning to understand that you are at work, that if we are willing to be humble, you are willing to grow in us all that needs to grow that our motives don't have to be fear or trying to impress people, but just sharing what you've given us so freely and the opportunities that you've given us as well. That there is a truth, and the truth is that there are things in our life that are so incredibly valuable and we don't see it. It's like a priceless treasure that we don't even recognize how great it is. And there are other things that we value so dearly. And in the course of our lives, they're going to do so little for us. And today, we're in your presence today. You've stepped into time 
and you are doing an amazing thing in our lives. We can't make it happen, but we can allow you to use those tools to cause it to happen in us. Would you grow us today? In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together.